Good morning, everyone. We welcome you to Freedom's Church here in person, and those joining us online, welcome. We pray that you had a beautiful and wonderful Thanksgiving. We're so glad to have you here with us following all that. We'll pray for those that are traveling back home today, um, and so we're just so grateful that we can join together. A few announcements for us. One, if you're a guest with us today, if you're a visitor, we encourage you to fill out our information prayer card just to let us know of your visit. Also, for anyone to fill this out if you have updated information or if you uh, have a prayer request for us. Please fill that out and put it in the offering plate later in the service or you can hand it to Pastor Dave or myself following the service. The flowers on the altar today are in honor of Audrey and Denny Shrew's anniversary and Deanne Engelke's birthday on November 24th. Happy anniversary and happy birthday. They're sitting on the back row. So, so glad you're here with us today and happy birthday, Deanne. You're such a blessing to us. The angel tree uh, is happening right now. We have the tags on the tree. This sponsors children served by the Guadalupe County Children's Protective Services. Uh, take a tag or more, and those unwrapped gifts are due by December 10th. You can bring them here to church on Sunday mornings, or if you need to, bring them by the church office during the week. And um, we'll be glad to take care of those for you. So make sure you grab a tag or more for us. Uh, it's a very special thing that we do at Christmas. Uh, the Women of Freedoms invite you to a Christmas tea on December 9th at 10.30 a.m. We have on sale raffle tickets uh, through, you can get them still that morning, but make sure you get them ahead of time, too. $5 for three of them, or, um, I mean, sorry, $5 for one, three for $10. So um, there are quilts and other prizes, and I've seen the quilt, it's beautiful, so Make sure you see the ladies after church this morning. They'll be glad to assist you with that. And also, meal reservations are available until uh, December 3rd, which will be next Sunday, $15 for those meal tickets, meal reservations, excuse me. Next Sunday is a congregational budget meeting. This is where we will approve as a congregation our 2024 budget. Can't believe we're at that time of year now as we prepare for the new year. So that will follow our 10 a.m. worship service next Sunday. So members, you can remain afterwards, and we'll have that budget meeting, and then you can be on your way. Um, Carrie Hardway is going to come and share with us now regarding our family promise dates that are coming up. Good morning. It's good to see you. Happy Thanksgiving. Once again, we'll be participating in Family Promise. We'll be providing evening meals for families that are involved in the program right now. There are currently two families, and they did say that they will probably be there, or they should be. Our uh, time that we'll be doing it is December 17th through the 30th, and they will be staying at Slumber Falls. Uh, we've been very successful in the past, and I appreciate all your help. Betty and I will post our emails starting next week, so if you have any questions, we do take the evening meals to Slumber Falls, and we're there by about 6, and we're there until about 7.30. And Betty and I will have the paper goods, everything we need. All we need are family volunteers to take the food there and drop it off, well, to stay with them while they're there. So as it gets closer, I will let you know how many family members are involved in the program. So thank you very much. And as I say, there'll be more information coming up. Thank you. So we've done Family Promise for the last few years, and it's a great uh, program for those that are transitioning from being homeless. That's, the program helps those folks with jobs and with child care, all kinds of things to prepare them then for moving into a, a permanent place of residence. Um, Slumber Falls Camp uh, is the same Slumber Falls Camp that closed and now has been bought by Friends of Slumber Falls, so it's still part of our um, congregation and uh, it will be held up that's on River Road so if you want more information please see Carrie or Betty Shriver or myself or Pastor Dave will be glad to help you um, it is a wonderful program you can go in with others to do this um, and so please uh, take advantage of that it's a wonderful opportunity and so special during the Christmas holidays today is Christ the King Sunday or the reign of Christ Sunday 
What that means is that it is the end of the church year, uh, the church calendar, and next week we'll begin with Advent, and we'll talk more about that in a few moments. But today we do celebrate that Christ is our King, that, that Christ will reign. He reigns over the earth and heaven, and then, of course, over our hearts. So that's what we're celebrating today as we remember and recognize that Christ is the King of our lives, of our hearts. Well, let us sing this morning. If you're able, please stand as we begin our worship together. Hymn number 176, Crown Him with Many Crowns. Crown Him with Many Crowns. And now Tripp Jaruszewski will come to lead us in our call to worship. Join me in our call to worship. Make a joyful noise to the Lord all the earth. Worship, worship the Lord from the cloud of his kingdom. His presence with singing. singing. Know that the Lord is God. It is, he, it is he that made us and we are his. We, we are, are his, his people, people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to God. Bless his name. For the, the Lord, Lord is good. good. His, his steadfast love endures forever and his and faithfulness, faithfulness to all generations. generations. Our praise song this morning is forever, which speaks of that steadfast love that goes on, endures forever. Thanks to the Lord, our God and King, His love endures forever. For He is good, He is above all things, His love endures forever. Sing praise, sing praise. With a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, his love endures forever for the life that's been reborn. His love endures forever. Sing praise, sing praise, sing praise. setting sun his love endures 
us forever. By the grace of God, we will carry on. His love endures forever. Sing praise. Sing praise. Sing praise. Sing praise. Sing praise. Forever God is faithful. Forever God is strong. Forever is forever. There's nothing that separates us from God's love and presence in our lives. Nothing does that. For those who are here today, it's great to see you. Those who are watching from home, be with us now today. I want you to do one thing with me. I want you to take a deep breath in. Everybody, deep breath in. Inhale. Not everybody's inhaling. Inhale. Now, slowly exhale. Doesn't that feel good? It's like the presence of God. The peace of Christ be with you all that share and pass the peace of Christ with one another. would like to invite the children down for our children's moment. Okay, I've got us three women and all these guys. And this, this is so cool. I love it. Like your past week. This is like my past week. Yes, I was with my step family in Virginia, and we had seven grandsons there. Not my grandsons, but those were all my nephews, and it, except for my son. It was amazing to have all those guys together. It was lots of fun. Okay, so I have uh, picked off a, a little angel from the angel tree. So Pastor Dave is talking about today a passage in the gospel, in the Bible, from Matthew, that where Jesus starts talking about ways in which people had served him, had taken care of him when he didn't have clothes, he didn't have water, he didn't have food, and he was in prison and all these things. And what it turns out is that the, the disciples, those around him, said, well, when, when was that? Because we don't remember seeing you like that. And he said, whenever you take care of others like that, others who don't have food or have clothing or water to drink or that have been put in jail or no clothing, all sorts of things, sick. You have then served me. That's what Jesus says, that when you help others, you are serving Jesus, which I think is an amazing thing because I want to worship and serve God. I want to serve Jesus. And so when I help others, for example, when we get an angel off the tree, like I'm going to get for a boy that's 12 years old, anything to do with sports, and I picked this one 
for Pastor Dave and myself because our son, who is much older than 12 now, he would know exactly what I need to get for this young man because he loves sports. But I got it because I thought, I want to show this young man that he's loved. And that is serving Jesus. When I do something at, like this, which seems very simple to me, it's easy. I can go to the store. I can get what I want to get for this young man. And hopefully, it will make his Christmas even better. And so whenever I do something like that, or I help with what we were talking about with the homeless families, that family promise, and some other projects that we will have coming up, we do that because we are serving. That's part of our, our job as Christians is to serve others. So Christmas coming up soon will be a great opportunity. It reminds us of how we can do this all year. We can bring gifts. We can take things. We can take food and water and all sorts of things and ways in which we can serve Jesus by serving others on the behalf of Jesus. So it's really cool. I love that we can do that. All right, let me say a prayer for us. Oh, holy God, I thank you for these young ones who love you, who show up and are present with us and make our day. And Lord, I ask that you bless them and all that they do and help each of us as we serve you by serving others, by caring for others. It is in your name we pray. Amen. And I want you to remember how much God loves you. All right, well, we have Sunday school. Miss Becky's back there for those that are over the age of four. So y'all can go on back. And we also have our nursery for those that are under four. Okay, y'all can go on. So next Sunday begins Advent, which is four weeks of preparation uh, for the coming of Christ. So Advent is not only where we prepare our hearts for Christmas, but it also focuses on the second coming of Jesus. And I thought this video would be a great way to remind us of the season. Since the early days of the church, many believers have celebrated Advent and Christmas as two separate seasons. The first season is for preparing and expecting. At Advent, we look forward to not one, but two arrivals. First, we anticipate and long for the birth of Jesus, just as the Jewish people long for the promised coming of the Messiah the king who would rescue them and return glory to Israel. Christmas, the end of the Advent season, is a celebration of that promise kept. The Messiah came, the Son of God sent first as a sacrifice for the forgiveness of our sin. But we wait still for him to come again, to return and make all things right, to take his place on the throne forever. At Advent, we prepare ourselves for that second arrival as well, with repentant hearts and joyful confidence that our God always keeps His promises. Come, our long-expected Savior. This Advent season, our theme will be the gift of presents. Not presents as in gifts, but the gifts of being present. And it will look at the gift of peace and hope and joy and love that we will celebrate this Advent and Christmas season. So be prayerful about our time to come, that it will be a meaningful season of, of Advent and then Christmas, but that we will bring about the gift of being present with others. Because Emmanuel, which Jesus is one of his names, it means God with us. God is present with us. So today we go to the Lord in prayer. 
uh, being prayerful for those among our congregation that are in need of our support, of our prayers, our care and compassion. We pray for our greater community as we always want to remember those that are struggling, those that are grieving. And then we pray for our world with areas of conflict and war. We always pray for peace. So let us begin with a time of silence in which we can focus on that presence of God that is with us. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we thank you that you are here with us that you have been waiting for us to worship you, that you've walked beside us. May we acknowledge your presence. May we call on you throughout the day and throughout the night. You are always there, and nothing separates us from you. You are in our hearts and in our spirits. May we reflect on you as we go throughout the next several weeks, as we prepare for the birth of Jesus, and as we also think to the future, whenever that second coming of Jesus will be, we will not know, but we will be prepared. Oh, gracious God, we lift up those that need you. Perhaps they don't know that they need you, but we pray, oh God, that they will find you that we will be part of them finding you, that we will show compassion and care, that we will be hospitable and welcoming, that we will take time to be present and to show of the love of Jesus Christ. And in so doing, O oh God, we will be serving you. We will be serving Jesus. We reflect on him being the king of our lives one that reigns in our hearts, that we are part of his kingdom. We are brothers and sisters to Jesus. May we celebrate that. May we embrace that. And all that we do, how we live out our lives, how we share of the good news and how we live and how we speak. And may we always Attempt to live out the words to the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our offertory hymn this morning is hymn number 304. The King of love my shepherd is. Jesus is the shepherd of our hearts. If you're able, please stand as we sing together. <laughs>
Amen. You may be seated. And as our ushers take the offering this morning, reflect on the ways in which Jesus is your shepherd. You may be seated. Please join me in our prayer of illumination. Dear God, give eyes to see, ears to hear, and hearts and minds to understand your word. Amen. Scripture reading today is from the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew 25, verses 31 through 46. Hear these words, the words of Jesus. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate people from one another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats, and he will put the sheep at his right hand and the goats at the left. Then the king will say to those at his right hand, Come, you that are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry and gave you food, or thirsty and gave you something to drink? And when was it that we saw you a stranger and welcomed you, or naked and gave you clothing? And when was it that we saw you sick or in prison and visited you? And the king will answer them, Truly, I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. Then he will say to those at his left hand, You that are accursed, depart from me into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not give me clothing. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they will also answer, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry or thirsty 
or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not take care of you? Then he will answer them, truly I tell you, just as you did not do it to one of these, least of these, you did not do it unto me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. So you're probably feeling pretty good until we got to this scripture passage, right? And we get to some words of judgment there, and we get to those, those, those trigger words that we'll find in scripture from time to time. Uh, when we get to uh, places like, oh, yeah, we're talking about d devil now and, and devil's angels and fire and places and uh, places of torment, things we don't want to think about or talk about, and we get kind of nervous when they come up. Uh, judgment day kinds of, of language that we have. And it does. It, it, it gets our attention very quickly. We're thinking, oh, yeah, there's this, there's this thing about the other side of what faith is for, for us. Well, I've got some good news for you today, okay? One is, don't worry. Don't worry. I want you to relax. We started this with the breathing technique when we passed the piece earlier. We can do it again if you need to. Take a deep breath in and exhale, because probably many of you on Thursday, when you were gathered around your tables and with your families and your friends, and you were carving and serving up various kinds of meats and vegetables and oh by desserts we may or may not have been thinking about oh yes there are hungry people in the world that need to be fed or the people that were hungry were the ones around your table waiting anxiously for you now to serve them the food for thanksgiving and so what we find in scriptures like this are moments that should give us pause that we need to think about and hear the words of jesus but I don't want you to be anxious about it. And here's why. This is not a message of like general condemnation for, for people. It really isn't. It may sound that way. And others, other people, other Christians, and maybe other pastors, preachers, will use this, use these words, and use it as a way to point fingers at judgment, particular followers and Christians and congregations about this is the things you need to be doing now if you want to be saved. I'm here to tell you this is much more broader than simply a way, a path of salvation. It's deeper meanings to that, and we need to understand the deeper meanings of this because it leads us to what Jesus expects for us, what God wants us, and to deeper levels of care and compassion for, for the world. This is what this is about today. It's at the end of chapter 25 of Matthew. It's at the end of this long now time of teaching and preaching and healing of Jesus that began way back in Matthew chapter 5 with the Sermon on the Mount. Now it culminates with this because the next several chapters of Matthew will be when Jesus goes into Jerusalem. He is confronted there. He has this holy week beginning with Palm Sunday and through that week until that Monday, Thursday, and Good Friday, the time of crucifixion and the resurrection. And then the last part of Matthew is this wonderful, great commission the resurrection Christ gives to his followers of going into the world and doing these things as he has taught them to do. And the previous chapters with, with Matthew leading up to this is all these questions that people have for Jesus. Jesus is being asked questions a lot often by, well, the Jewish leaders, the, the religious leaders of the time, his own disciples, people in the crowds, asking them Jesus' questions when he says something. When he says things like, I'm going to be going to Jerusalem, and I'll be put to death, but I will rise again. Or when he says that even the temple will be destroyed itself, and the stones will fall away. And they were asking him then questions like this, well, when is this going to occur? How will we know? What are the signs of these times? They wanted to know when and how to be during this time. So Jesus gives them this long set of answers to that question. They're in the answers in the form of parables and teaching. And the first, the first uh, question asked of him that he gives answers is to the people of Israel. The people of Israel. He says, this is what you do in the meantime. You are willing and you are ready. You are prepared for this coming when the Son of Man comes again, but you don't know what's going to be. Just be working in the meantime to those Jewish followers. 
And then a message to, to the Christian followers too. It says, you need to be obedient to me as a slave is to, to your master. But then there were also questions too about what about everybody else? What about all these Romans who are here and these other nationalities who are here in this land as well that come from different places all around us? That part of the world then with Jesus and with Matthew was one in which people moved around fairly freely and they did trade and they would go to different places. They could do that. And the question became, well, what about everybody else? And Jesus ends, ends this discourse with this wonderful, wonderful statement. And he says to them, that when the Son of Man comes again in glory and the angels with him, he will sit on the throne of glory. And all the nations will be gathered before him. All the nations, that means all those nations outside of Israel, everybody else who were called the pagans at the time, including Rome, including Rome will be gathered before him. That's a very important, very important uh, fact, by the way, because at that time, the nations, they thought were just of the Roman Empire, and who, who sat on the throne of the Roman Empire? Caesar himself in Rome. In fact, it was Caesar in Rome who called himself Lord of Lords, Son of God in life. And you owe all your allegiance to Caesar and to Rome. But Jesus says, even that he knows they're conspiring against him, that one day, even they, they think there are kings on earth, and they may be, but there is an ultimate king, and that will be me, and everyone will be answered to me then. And then he will begin to separate people from one another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. I don't know a lot about raising sheep and goats, but you do. I've heard you talk about it. I have nothing against goats in, in my life, but no, this time is separating when the shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. A long time ago, uh, when I was struggling in some places in my life, I had this recurring dream. Anybody have recurring dreams in your life? Yeah, I, I have them. Uh, and one was this, that I was, I, was, I was in heaven, and I was in a line, and there were two lines. And every time I got to the line, I would see the two people in these lines. And I look up and I see the sign, one that says sheep and one was goats. And I was always thrilled at some point that I was in the sheep line. Thank goodness I was in the sheep line. I was happy about that. I knew nothing about being a sheep, but I was in the sheep line. And I looked around, there was a goat line. I felt so bad for the people in, in the goat line. And then I would look around at other sheep in line in front and then in the back of me. I'm thinking, oh, yeah, they're definitely sheep. They should be in this line. People that I knew personally or people that I knew of in the world. And certainly, they're like saint people. They do wonderful things in all of life that I know of personally or have heard about. Yeah, they're definitely in the sheep line. And, and, then, and then I would look over at the goat line and thinking, oh, you poor goats. You know, and I said, oh, I know that person personally. I never thought there would be a goat in, in my in the life and in, in what it was to come. And then I started looking around to it more in the sheep line, and something that really would grasp, get me, and maybe it's why I was having this dream, is people I thought, well, surely would never be in the sheep line. How did you get in this line? I know you personally. I know what you've done, what you've said, who you are. You're no sheep. Oh, no, no, no. You, you're, 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 you're in the goat line. I don't know how you got in this line. How did you get in my line? And I look around, the front and the back, people there. And I thought, oh, my goodness. And what would really speak to me is I'm not the one who determines the sheep or the goats in life. I don't. You don't either. This is something that God does. So what do we do? Well, no one wants to be the goat, right? Now, in our modern-day vernacular and terminology, especially in sports world, we call people goats. An acronym meaning the greatest of all time. Have you heard that? Have you heard that? You know, there's a debates, especially in the NBA, who is the GOAT? Who is the greatest of, of, of all time? And sports will do that constantly. It's like some kind of second-hand side job. Let's, let's have a debate, discussion, who is the greatest of, of all time? And there'll be de debates about who is this particular GOAT. All right. In our story today, this, we're not talking about greatest of all time. The greatest of all time is going to be Jesus, our Lord and Savior. We're talking about sheep and goats separated there. How is this done? And Jesus says, come you that are blessed 
blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Come. And then he gives a description of how that's carried out. Now here's the thing. For the nation of Israel, the, the children of Abraham, sons and daughters of Abraham, were given that great promise that they lived out through the life of Moses and the law of Moses even to that day. There's not condemnation for them. There's this blessedness. Many of them, these followers were the poor and were the ones put in prison. By the time that Ma Matthew is writing this gospel to his community, this is a generation after the time of Jesus, and many of his followers were indeed the ones persecuted, stripped away of things. They were beaten, accursed themselves, followers of Jesus. They're the ones put into prisons. We, read, we know that from the time of the Apostle Paul. We know that from a lot of the legends of the early apostles of Jesus, how they were very much mistreated and executed for their faith. And in this first century world there in Rome, and later on it gets even worse, the persecution of Christians at the hands of the Romans. They knew what this was like to live this way. But not everybody, not everybody in this Roman world was a cruel, evil, mean person. There were many who took on this faith, even though they were born outside of the nation of Israel, outside of the covenant people, they still would do some good things. And so when, when the, it says that the nations are gathered before him, the nations are this, the Greek word is ethne. It means like all the outside, the Gentile nations, everybody else outside of what we would call people from the Judeo-Christian heritage. All these other people in the world gathered. And then what will, be, what will be the judgment for them? Well, Jesus takes a look at them and said, Ah, here are the ones, here are the ones who are in my Father's will. And he goes through this list. For when I was hungry, you gave me food. I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. A stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, you took care of me. In prison, and you visited me. When they did that, when they have done that, when we have done that, this is exactly what Jesus Christ is wanting for us in our own lives. Our own lives to do this. You see in the time of Jesus... When you were in this particular predicament in your life where you needed this help, you were thought of a being accursed yourself. In fact, the religious leaders would say to people like that, you or your family must have done something wrong in your life. You must have sinned against God for you to be cursed and living this way. You are obviously not blessed the way we see blessing. Therefore, you are not of God. You can't be of God. You need to stay away from us because you are sinful person afflicted by something so you stay away they were never a part of an accepted community and jesus changed all of that all of that even if it wasn't their fault that they had were living in such a way and jesus says it doesn't matter it doesn't matter what you might believe what you might profess this is what you do it's a wonderful statement it should give us all some hope in our own lives. For you see, it's like this. There's no point system in this kingdom of God. There's not a point system. You can't earn your way there. You can't go through and check out these boxes. It's, oh, I've done all this now. I get to enter the kingdom of God. Now I guess I can just go home, go to sleep, and not worry about it. No, it's just what we are doing in the meantime, not motivated out of judgment, not motivated out of fear, not motivated out of anxiety or even threats to ourselves. simply motivated by the love we have of God and Jesus and for one another. That's the motivation. That's the motivation. And you have been participating in this much of your life, whether you have known it or not. How do we do this? Anytime, anytime we do small things in life that help the least of these, the most vulnerable in our society, are those moments in which we are doing this will of God in our own lives. We're doing this. You've been doing this. 
and I would say that if there's any kind of word of judgment here, it would be this. It would be this for us. Some will say, well, Pastor Dave, I know I need to do these things and more of these things, whether it's involved in church or being active in one of our many, many helping organizations out there in the community that will help people like this. I, I just don't have time. I'm just too busy to do this. I wish I had more time. I say, yes, you need to, you need to make some more time for this. Now, if your busyness, if your busyness is a reason, a good reason that you can't actively participate, then maybe there's some other ways that you can participate. But busyness is no excuse for no participation at all. That, my friend, is where the judgment starts to play into our lives. There's no excuses for not doing the things that we can do. Whether it's here in Geronimo and this county, this area, this region, our state, around the world. Anytime that you go or give, you are participating in helping the least of these. This is exactly the message that we have as a church. And again, not out of judgment that you get to check off a box. No, it's compelled out of love. It's compelled out of love. And God knows your heart and your life and who you are, what you do. It's, it reminds me of this. A number of years ago, a long number of years ago now, back in my college days, back in the 1980s. Oh, that hurts to even say that now. So, you know, this was the age of uh, leg warmers and fitness clubs. And, you know, you know you remember, who remembers the 80s? Remember the 80s? Yeah, a few of you remember the 80s. I uh, know, so too long ago for many of you. So I, I knew there were the 80s because we're here now, but I don't remember the 80s. It was there. Uh, back in college, I remember taking one, this particular college course early on. It might have been my freshman year. I can't remember now. But uh, uh, one of those classes that most everybody has to take in class. And in this particular class happened to be about four or five or so, a certain group of students who had just, just pledged into one of the fraternities on campus, one of the on campus, and, and I guess it was some kind of group goal of theirs to do nothing all semester. They're going to do the very minimum amount that was needed for the class. Come to class occasionally, do some work half-heartedly occasionally, and, and get to the class. Well, we got to the last week of class, and the professor now starts to, to tell people, here are, what, here are the expectations now uh, from the syllabus and for the final and the final uh, project and the final exam in order to pass the class. And suddenly now, uh, a fraternity, fraternity team has realized they're not going to pass the class. They've gone, they participated slightly, lightly, in all these weeks of class, and they're not going to... To, to pass, and I, and I began to hear them talk amongst themselves behind me in class, and they were talking about we're going to meet with the professor and come up with their ideas for now some last minute extra credit in order to pass the class. And I heard them talking about that. And, and, and so th this was a Monday, Wednesday, Friday class. This was on a Monday, and they were back on class on Wednesday, and as soon as the class begins, <laughs> I'll never, I don't even remember the class. I remember this professor telling us this. He, first thing he says, and he gets up in class saying, I just want everyone here in class to know that you've had the syllabus and the outline since day one of class. There is no extra credit to pass this class. And you, in, in between the, some laughter, and I thought might have been a few tears behind me, to hear all that, they realize, no, the time was up for them. Friends, the, the, the place of faith is like this. We have our opportunities here and now in this life, in this world, today, tomorrow, things that we do participate in. It's not a matter of kind of just skating through life, avoiding things in life, not really participating at the deeper levels of care and compassion of life, and then kind of waiting at the last minute to say, oh, you know what, Jesus, is there any extra credit I can do to, to get on the good side of things? You know, uh, on the two lines that we have between the sheep and the goats, the goats don't get extra credit. You know, it's, it's not there. But I don't want you to worry so much about that at this point. That's just to say, because we're compelled out of love as well in our lives. 
And it is this, what Jesus is looking for, and what matters of faith are looking for this, will there be enough people in the here and now participating in this life of Christ that will make a big change in this world? And you may be thinking, you know, I, I can't change the world, Pastor Dave. There's too many problems, too many issues, too much hunger and poverty and bad things that go on. I said, I understand that. But maybe think of it this way. Maybe try to change the world for one person at a time. Change their life. One person, one family, one community at a time. That's what we're doing. And when enough of that happens, that is when the wonderful things happen in all of life. Let me tell you where we're at now, where you're at now. I think this is the case. Jesus begins in the Gospel of Matthew with meeting with a large group of people on the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus didn't know all these people. They had heard about Jesus. They had showed up to hear his teachings on this day. He begins to teach them. And here's the, what he starts out with. I love this. Matthew 5. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up the mountain. And after he sat down, his disciples came to him. And then he began to speak and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great already in heaven, for in the same way they persecute the prophets who were before you. And then these wonderful statements. You, all of them, including you now, my friends, you are the salt of the earth. But don't lose the salt if it don't lose its taste. Be good. It is no longer good for salt that loses its taste. So be good. You are the light of the world. A city built on a hill cannot be hid. And no one after lighting a lamp puts it under a bushel basket to be hid, but on a lampstand for all to see and gives light to all the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. That's what Jesus says. You've got the salt. You've got the light. Use it. Let it shine. It's there. You're not being judged for that. You're given an opportunity to use it in life. That's the great hope that we all have. And we have ways of participating in that. We read through some of those today. When you take an angel off the tree, you are doing these things. Did you know that when you're participating this year, uh, in years with the Christmas tea, I want you to buy your tickets to sign for that, because this year we're having two representatives from Guadalupe Valley Habitat for Humanity to speak on their good work. And when you have shown up and helped with Habitat in the past, I don't want us to do this more often, you're doing these things. You're helping out. When you participate uh, with helping with the Christian cupboard, our Panthers Feeding Panthers, our Family Promise, or with the Texas Ramp Project, when you're just helping people, you are participating in these things. And it's not that you're checking off a list. You're letting light shine into the world. And maybe, 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 with all the hope that we have, that will change the life of the people involved. You never know the impact you're going to have on someone's life for the good. For the good. And we need to be doing that. It's not that we're sitting in some kind of way of judgment. No, we're sitting in the opportunity to let our light shine that changes the world. Motivated, compelled by God's love for us and our love for each other. How do we know this? How do we know this? On a certain day, Jesus told this a parable about a certain man who was simply traveling from one city to another. He got to a dark, bad, dangerous place. He was attacked and beaten up by robbers. And they left him there for dead. And someone shows up that day, doesn't know this person, doesn't know the circumstances, but simply stops 
and helps. Didn't ask him questions, didn't ask him where he was from, what he believed, you know, didn't ask to see his passport, anything like that. Just stopped and helped, and that becomes the story of the Good Samaritan. And Jesus said to the person who asked about just who is my neighbor in life, who in this story was the neighbor? You see, this is what Jesus wants from us. Oh, we need to have care and compassion in the world. We can't do everything. There, there, there are some boundaries and safeguards we have to put into place with that. I understand that. But Jesus is looking for what are the people showing up and helping out with the deeper levels of this in life. That's how we acknowledge Jesus as Lord of Lord and King of Kings and the Prince of Peace ab above anything and anyone else in life. This is the culmination of our great story of life in the church. Can we live into this more fully each and every day, helping each other out and helping others out in times of their need, not judging them for where they are in life, but simply helping them and doing it in the name and the love of Jesus Christ and of God? Recently, I heard this wonderful story. It happened a number of years ago, I think, of a, of a certain youth group and people in the youth group and how they would meet and come and learn and they, and they would learn about the love of God for themselves and they'd learn the stories of Jesus about helping out a neighbor and neighbor. And one particular day, one of the persons of this youth group was out and about and they encountered some people of their own age who were just treating them uh, very badly and rudely, saying some very ugly, harsh, mean, mean things. And so what do you do when you encounter that? Sometimes I don't even know myself. Uh, when you're encountering that. But this one person, because of what they had learned from this youth group and church in their lives, simply went up to the person and said to them, God loves you. And that was it. Didn't it mean to change their lives or the world or anything that day? Didn't throw any kinds of flaming arrows of judgment or punishment toward them. Just simply said, God loves you. And in a way that's saying, I love you too, and simply walks away. What was not known at the time was that later on, this very person who was the, the, the agitator in this and, and, and meanful and, and hateful speech and just probably very harsh and hurtful words shows up at this youth group months later and says that one day someone unexpectedly just simply said that God loves me. That in my life, no one ever told me that I was loved or that I mattered or that I cared. No one really showed me the way of anything in life except for being mean and cruel and ugly. And someone just simply, not out of judgment, but out of deep care and compassion, just said I was loved. Changed the life of that one person. That's light being shined into the world and we'll never know the ripple effect that has with people in their lives one life change changes others and more and more and more it's simply participating in this life of christ not doing it because we're going to fear that we'll miss out and have to go jump into some kind of lake of fire with the devil and the angels no no it's about doing this out of just sheer love as God so loved the world that he gave his only son. And we strive to live that every day through words, through actions, through our attitudes. Small things become bigger things. Bigger things become larger things. Larger things become world-changing things. And don't you think our world needs a little more of that today and every day? So the question is for us all. Will we be the ones who do this? Not going out from here today into the world and looking for people to judge and to condemn, but will we be the ones who come from this place today out into the various places of our worlds simply to be the salt and light to a hurting world and hurting people? It's, it's not just the very poor and, and destitute and those who are in prison uh, and, and stranger, and, and those that are hurting in this life. Some of the most hurting people 
and don't feel that they're welcome people, maybe people in your own family, in your own neighborhoods, in your own places of business. People, because of some losses in life, some hurts and pains in life, just don't feel they ever belong or that they're loved or appreciated. They may be walking around looking, looking like they are indeed blessed on the outside. But maybe on the inside, there's so much inner turmoil through their spirits and in their minds, emotionally, mentally, spiritually in their lives. Those are the ones, too, that when you show up and help them, it's as if you're helping Jesus Christ there on the spot. Do you see this? Do you get this? It's that easy. We have to overcome our own barriers to get there. Our own biases and prejudices, our own hurts at times to get there. But God is with us, and that is the essence of Jesus, our King, our King today and forever. Let us pray. Oh, holy God, we give you thanks for the great words of Jesus, the message of Jesus, parables, and his instruction, how he encountered those who were powerful but not helping, even trying to teach his own disciples who themselves would be persecuted mildly. For that, though, oh Lord, we know that Jesus indeed, even though he was crucified, that Jesus was resurrected by your power. And Jesus lives today as, as he did then physically. He lives today with us spiritually. Help us to be guided by that spirit, O oh God, that when we see a need, that we meet a need, and not for ourselves, but simply for you, and how that one act can change, change the world. In Christ we pray. Amen. Our ending hymn today is hymn number 322, The Church is One Foundation. My friends, we are indeed have been built on a foundation. The foundation is there, and that is Jesus Christ. And now we build upon that foundation for this world. Let us stand and sing together. The life of God that we know through Jesus Christ is one that gives us that sense of victory and overcoming everything in all of our lives. It's simply a matter of putting our faith into practice and with sharing love. Remember outside, uh, or just in the, in the narthex today, there's, there's 
uh, angels on the tree, and there is uh, tickets for the Christmas tea. I think for the Christmas tea, they're also looking for door prizes. Is that correct? Yes, I'm hearing voices. They're looking for door prizes. So uh, see the group there in the back today. Uh, participate in the life of this church uh, the best that you can in all your lives. It's great to see you here today. I know you had a wonderful uh, Thanksgiving and holidays. Uh, young people, school tomorrow. Just letting you know, in case no one has let you know that yet, school tomorrow. Uh, now we prepare our hearts and minds now beginning next week for Advent and our Christmas season. Friends, God loves you. God is with you. God just wants you to participate in this great life of, with God together. We know that most fully in Jesus Christ and what we do as a church. So today, as we depart this place and go into our lives, I pray that we will live simply, love generously, serve faithfully, speak truthfully, and pray daily, and leave everything else to God. Amen. Over all the earth, you reign on high. Every mountain stream, every sunset sky. But my one request, Lord, my only end, is that you'd reign in me again. Lord, reign in me, reign in your power over all my dreams in my darkest hour. darkest hour, you are the 